How are we feeling? We're doing good, yeah. <sighs> well, that, that was kind of that was kind of weak. Can, can we try it again? How are we feeling, everyone? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you're full of lunch and full of conversations. So yeah, so we'll get that energy up in here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get that energy up. Hey, hey. Yeah. Hmm. Mm. Mm. So, Derek. Yes. How was your afternoon? My afternoon was great. You know, I, I, I have my coffee. Now I'm ready for the session. Yeah. Oh, oh, you got a lot of cream in there. That's how I like it. Two creams, two sugars, right? Wow, okay. Uh, okay, what, what was that? Okay, how do you like your coffee? Straight, black, like a champ. So wait, what, what are you saying? I'm not a champ because I don't drink my coffee black? No, I just, I just think it's weird because you're a grown man and drinking milk with a splash of coffee. Okay, well, you know what? It sounds like to me that you need to diversify, all right? I mean, there's cream, there's milk, almond milk, oat milk, hemp milk, French vanilla, hazelnut. Sounds to me like you need to be more progressive with your coffee drinking. What, are, are you accusing me of not being progressive? You know what, I don't appreciate that type of toxic language. Well, you're accusing me of not being something that I am when there are different ways to drink coffee. Why are you so tense? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> maybe it is the coffee, okay? <laughs> the, I just love my coffee the way I love my coffee. Okay. I mean, have you ever tried coffee with two creams and two sugars? Why would I? I'm a champ. Okay, I don't know. Maybe you can try my coffee to get a better understanding of it before you judge it. Okay, I mean, seriously, it's, it's just coffee. Oh, it's you're, just coffee. You're right, you're right, it is. But all joking aside. Jokes aside. I find myself being in these kind of situations and conversations where I'm always having to defend my point of view around things I feel strongly about. Yeah, and my fuse can be pretty short when it comes to things that I don't agree with or that I, have to, I feel like I have to protect. I mean, my roots are strong and deep, seen and unseen, loved and feared. And my roots are conflicted, wrangled in generations of war, violence, and sadness, but still strong, nurtured, and resilient. I fear speaking my truth and not being heard. I'm afraid of being in a room full of people and being viewed as the other. Viewed as the other and always being misunderstood. Or being told you're wrong over and over again. Until you believe everything they say instead of trusting your gut, your worth, and your resilience. I want to hear other people's points of view, even if I don't agree. And to take time to listen and understand. You know, I don't like assumptions. The ones that I make are the ones that are made about me. And I fear the uncertainty of what our world will become. Still, I fight for us all to live a life where we can dictate our choices. And not be victims of circumstance. Now, this afternoon's session is sponsored by KPMG. Welcome speakers who bring passions, points of view, bold opinions, authenticity times 10, and then some. This session will be moderated by Mary Frances Winters, Forum Advisory Group member, DEI Thought Leader, and the president, founder and president of the Winters Group and author of several books, including You Can't Talk About That at Work and Inclusive Conversations, Fostering Equity, Empathy, and Belonging Across Differences. Please welcome Mary Frances Winters. Thank you, thank you. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Forum's Living Room. I am so honored to fill in for my friend Michelle Meyership, the Chief Diversity Officer at KPMG, who is sponsoring this session, as you just heard. She could not uh, be here. But we're happy to invite you all into our home for some real talk. So may I offer you some tea, some coffee, a glass of wine. I want you to be comfortable um, so that you can enjoy um, our hospitality. I'm so happy to share the forum's living room with some very, very special guests who you will meet um, in just a moment. We know that we are living in very, very polarizing times. And sometimes when we do our sessions at the Winters Group, we ask participants to give one word in terms of how they feel about the socioeconomic climate. And the words we hear are sad, and frustrated, and angry, and hopeless, and even scared. So I wrote this book called We Can't Talk About That at Work, How to Talk About Race, Religion, Politics, and Other Polarizing Topics, because 
we need to have real conversations so that we can get to real solutions. And I contend that we're not having the conversations because we don't know how, because we're very uncomfortable, and because we've been actually taught not to have some of these conversations. And today we seem to have a cancel culture. It's exacerbated by social media. So if I don't like your view or I misinterpret it, I cancel you, I fire you. We live in this unforgiving, punishing culture where we don't just get it quite right. I also think that oftentimes we think we're having a dialogue when we're really debating. When we debate, there's only one, or one right answer. When we dialogue, we keep it open to other, um, other possibilities. So this afternoon, we're going to do that. And our guests today know all too well about being canceled for what might be considered controversial views. Our inability to have civil discourse about complex topics is a global issue. And today, we're going to have a chance to engage both from a US and a global uh, perspective. And so we're going to show a brief video that will give you some background on some of our guests. Minneapolis Church and its pastor have been voted out of their denomination over disagreements on same-sex marriage. Members of the Evangelical Covenant Church voted out First Covenant Church and Pastor Don, Dan Collison today at their annual meeting in Omaha. Todd Wilson is here, and Todd, this isn't going over well with some members. No, 75% of the executive board voted to remove the church and its congregation, and a bit later they voted to remove its pastor. In a statement, the ECC says clergy must refrain from same-sex weddings, congregations must refrain from hosting same-sex weddings and related events, and the board has authority to credential a pastor. Previously, First Covenant stated it would treat LGBTQ members as equals, and would be open to having same-sex marriages. On their Facebook page, they posted a message. It reads in part, We are deeply grieved as we find ourselves cast out by a denomination that has historically been able to hold differences and find a middle way. We begin with the fractious issue of Palestine and Israel in the U.S. news media, the boundaries around that discussion, who gets to set them, and what ultimately is allowed to be set. Last week, a CNN contributor, a commentator the network had on its payroll, delivered a speech at the United Nations in support of Palestinian self-determination and equal rights. Less than 24 hours later, CNN was done with Mark Lamont Hill. When you boil it down, he was fired for using the following six words, from the river to the sea. That was deemed anti-Semitic. There comes a point in your life and in your work where you have to take a principled stand and some people aren't going to agree with you. Right. I stand with a firm critique of Israel. I stand on, on, in solidarity with Palestinian people, and I also stand against anti-Semitism. Those aren't competing claims. You know what I mean? You can, you, can, you can love Jewish people and say that Jewish lives are not worth more than Palestinian lives, that Israeli lives are not worth more than Palestinian lives. And I can say also that everybody who criticizes Israel doesn't hate Jews, and, and I would hope that most don't. The ritual humiliation of being a child walking through checkpoints when I'm when I'm watching women have to go the go go through forests and 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 bushes to go around checkpoints, eight, 80 and 90 year old women to sell to sell vegetables in East Jerusalem, and then they get fined and they lose all their money. When I'm watching children getting beaten with nightsticks, when I'm watching stop and frisk on Via Della Rosa, the the, the very walkway where Jesus uh, occupied the seven stations of the cross, when I'm watching that happen, and I'm also watching children being stopped and frisked, which is outside the tradition of any religion. When I'm watching people being killed and maimed, and I'm, I'm watching this, there's no way I can see that and not speak out against it. Right. And again, this doesn't mean that harm doesn't happen to Jewish people. This isn't, this isn't a, a, an Olympics. We can, we can talk about both at the same time. And I understand that there's a deep pain and a deep frustration and a deep memory of the Holocaust. And so we must always make sure that people are safe, that minority populations are, are not vulnerable. I agree with that a thousand percent. That's why I say we don't have to choose between Jewish security and Palestinian freedom. And, and, and the honest answer is, and people don't want to say this, until there is complete freedom for everybody, nobody's safe. What's remarkable to me is that for a time in the 70s, 80s, and even into the 90s, liberals were very focused on making America multicultural. We weren't going to have an American culture. We didn't need a single language. Uh, everybody could come here, stay in their own little enclave, speak their own language, continue their own cultural practices, and that was the liberal ideal. Um, in fact, it doesn't work. It has never worked in the United States. Good reasons for the United States to continue to accept refugees and asylees. 
Uh, yes, they have to be properly vetted. Yes, we should try to promote assimilation once they're here. Um, but to close our doors when you have one of the wor world's worst refugee crises going on, it's the worst refugee crisis going on in the world right now since World War II. And for America to shut our doors, I, it's just not American to me. You use the word assimilation. I've been using that word yeah, for 30 absolutely. years. And I will tell you, it's a dirty word in the Democratic Party. We don't want to talk about assimilation. We've got to talk about multiculturalism. Let everybody keep their own language. That does turn people off. People expect that if you come here, you yeah. learn English. Melting you, you pot. Yeah. Melt, melt. Well, build. melt a little. But, yes. And they come here to work because we need them and we need their labor. Right. And Sir Michael, with all I, due respect, yes. I'm sorry. If I'm an employer, I don't necessarily want to hire somebody who's been on disability, who hasn't worked in the last, you know, uh, 15 months. I would rather have somebody who's come here who sees the bottom rungs of the ladder as a stepping stone. Real talk. Please join me in welcoming our guests. <laughs> Nassim Yasim, who is not on the video, is no stranger to Real Talk, and we'll hear more from her later. She's the DNI lead for Shell in the UK, and she really wants to make DNI a global um, conversation. Of course, Linda Chavez, who needs no introduction. She's an acclaimed author, syndicated columnist, radio host, and former political analyst for Fox News, and she serves on the board of ABM Industries. And we have the Dr. Reverend Dan Colison. Um, I had the oppor opportunity to meet him yesterday and learn that we share the same alma mater, the University of Rochester. That's the other Rochester, Rochester, New York. And he has um, a wonderful story for us. And Dr. Mark Lamont Hill, who also needs no introduction, an author, a commentator, intellectual, and obviously not afraid to have the difficult um, conversations. So Nassim, since you weren't on the video, we will start with you and share a little bit about yourself and your work and your perspective on the global tensions that are dividing us and why we can't seem to have some kind of civil discourse. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name's Nassim Yassin. I'm um, the DNI lead for Shell UK. Prior to that, I was a consultant um, for, a, for a long time before I went in-house, um, working in a variety of sectors, so not-for-profit, corporate, health, education. I think one of the main tensions uh, for me that divides society, you know, we, we don't talk about race and ethnicity. We tread on eggshells. We don't want to have that difficult conversation. Um, and every time I go into an organization and want to have that conversation, you know, it's a bit like your book. Let's not talk about that here because it's not going to get anywhere. Mm. And I think, you know, we hear the word white privilege and we turn people off. So we turn people of color off and we actually turn white people off. And what we need to be doing is to be able to accept that, to actually be able to make amends, so acknowledge what's gone on, but then work together and collaborate to be able to be those people that look to the future and are future fluent. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate that. So you're saying we need to call it like it is, right? We, we do. Put, we it, put, it right do. On that, put it right on that on absolutely. the table. Absolutely. Do, do I want to spend the rest of my life, you know, wanting every white person I come across to go through the pain that my ancestors went through? No, I don't. What I want to do is for people to acknowledge it and to move on from it and then to work together to be able to make to use that white privilege to make this world a better place. Yeah. So it's not about blame and shame. No. It's, it's more about just accepting and acknowledging that this did happen yeah. and not being afraid to, to, to really... Absolutely. Let's not mask it. Why, why do we want to mas mask it? We're not asking people to... We're not going to go back hundreds of years mm -hmm. and we're not going to make you know, that disappear. Right. So let's accept our history to be able to move to our future. Why don't you think we do accept our history? Because I think we're scared. We're scared. Mm. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're scared. You know, for... Every, every community is scared if we start to open up. So m my mum, um, in, in the South Asian culture, we don't have green eyes. We don't have blonde hair. You know, the, it's not in our genetics. My mum had green eyes. My mum was very fair. My sister does. And growing up, I used to joke with her and say to her, actually, your ancestors played away. And one day she broke down and she said to me, it's not that they played away. It's that they were raped. Or, you know, and it's being able to accept things like mm -hmm. that and actually move on from it. Yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you, Nassim. Linda, I read your farewell to your readers on Creators Syndicate, 
And you said that it was hard to leave a job that you love, but that you must because what attracted you in the first place seems to have disappeared. So tell us about that. Well, first of all, obviously it had a dramatic effect on me. It turned my hair white overnight. I don't know if you noticed. Uh, I, uh, I did have to give up my column. Um, and I was a column that I had been writing since 1987. So I'd been doing it for quite a, a long time. As you could hear on the video, I'm a conservative. I've been a Republican for a long time. I worked in the Reagan White House. Um, and... Um, I have always believed that I was a Republican because the party stood for certain things that I agreed with. But one of those things that it stood for was equality of opportunity, not necessarily equality of results, but that we have a level playing field, that we try to ensure that we have a level playing field because we know that in terms of education, we don't uh, to this day still have a level playing field for all children, uh, and that is unfortunate. But what I found over the last, really, four years, since 2015, when Donald Trump uh, decided that he was going to run for the presidential nomination, was that uh, I could not defend what I considered to be policies and positions uh, that were inconsistent with my principles and my values. And I have remained a Republican because I don't want to be driven out of uh, the party. Uh, but I could not vote for Donald Trump, uh, will not vote for him again this time. And what I found was that with my column, almost every column over the last three years has been about Donald Trump. And I also found that my role that I had always thought I had played rather well was trying to convince people who disagreed with me. I am known for going into audiences where the people start off by saying, you know, they disagree. Uh, and this audience may be one such of those audiences, I don't know. But after the course of the conversation and after the course of my making presentations, what I have found is that while people didn't en masse come over to my point of view, they did generally say, we respect your point of view and we understand why you take the positions you do. And what I found was in this increasingly polarized environment, you can't have those conversations. It's not about convincing people. It is, as you said, Mary Frances, it's about canceling people. It's about basically saying, if you don't agree me with me, you are the enemy. And I think that is deeply corrosive of our civil society. And so I found that it was time for me to go on and to do other things. And so that's what I've done. All right. Well, thank you very much. So do you think this polarization is exacerbated by social media? I think it's very much exacerbated by uh, social media. I will tell you that um, it's, you know, the kind of tweets I get after I'm on television, the kind of emails I get. I've always gotten uh, some negative. Used to be from the left. Now I get it more from the right than the left. <laughs> um, you know, I was always being told to go back where I came from. Uh, my family has been in what is now the United States for 400 years. It's a little tough for me to do that. And the only immigrants in my family came from Ireland. Uh, and I don't think anyone was telling me to go back to Ireland. Uh, so, you know, uh, it has been bad for a while, but it's gotten much worse. It's gotten threatening. It's gotten personally vicious. And I think uh, people can do this anonymously now. You used to have to at least write something and, you know, put it in an envelope. Now you can just sit at your anonymously at your laptop and, and say horrible things. And I think all of the social norms have loosened and people feel free to be really ugly. I think one of the things that you've taught us is that, you know, conservative or liberal, um, that you can stand for um, uh, what is just and what is fair. And that's, that's what I've always tried to do. I've, again, I've always tried to persuade people. I've been a critic, for example, of affirmative action programs uh, in higher education. Not because I wanted to see fewer black and Hispanic and Asian students in school, 
but because I thought the way schools went about bringing in people was setting them up for failure. And that there uh, were programs that uh, actually put kids at a tremendous disadvantage. A student who might have done very well at the University of California, Santa Barbara, or Riverside, suddenly is at UC Berkeley and is struggling. And so what I've been trying to do is to talk about, number one, catching the inequality in education at a point at which we can do something about it. And that's in elementary and secondary schools. By the time you get college age, if you haven't learned the basics, if you haven't taken math classes, if you cannot write a grammatically correct sentence and paragraph and essay, you're going to be at a disadvantage. And it's very difficult to teach that to you at the age of 18. Not impossible if you recognize the problem and decide to try to do something about it, but it's more difficult than getting in where the work really needs to be done with, when uh, people are children. Yeah, I don't disagree that the work needs to be done there. I'm a proud product of affirmative action. Um, went to the University of Rochester in Rochester, New York, when there were um, 69 out of 5,069 black students, the first year that they allowed students in. I had good grades. I wouldn't have been able to go to the University of Rochester um, if it weren't for affirmative action. And by the way, I taught in the first affirmative action program at the University of Colorado, and we also brought in students who couldn't meet the criteria to get in normally. But I went to the English department and I said, if you put these kids into regular classes, they're going to flunk out. They can't write, you know, full paragraphs that are grammatically correct with proper spelling. So I created a program where the students took an extra year and uh, they got tutoring, we had special classes, we emphasized very basic kinds of, of uh, training in language arts, and those st students succeeded. But most schools are not willing to do that work. Most schools are just like their numbers to look good and bring people in and it's sink or swim and unfortunately too many people sink. We're going to move on to Dan, but I just have to make one more point. My son is a professor at Duke University, and he tells me that the uh, privileged kids who came from great schools can't write or make a sentence either. So anyway. <laughs> so um, thank you, uh, Linda. Um, Dan, um, we saw you on the video. So how does religion fit into the tensions that we're experiencing? Yeah. I feel like religion fits intimately into the tensions, whether it's in the marketplace or in the public square. And my personal journey is one of largely living in homogenous Christian Protestant tradition up until 11 years ago. And uh, when I came downtown Minneapolis, I was invited to restart an urban, downtown urban congregation that was almost bankrupt. And you know, you can do restarts of different kinds, a homogenous sort of restart. The intuition was that this block and this community needed to be truly contextualized, and that was the journey I had signed up for and was reaching for. And I had a mentor who said to me, uh, if you do this or when you do this, make sure you lead with the question, what do you have to learn? What do I have to learn? And that's been a through line in my entire experience of these 11 years. And to the question directly, uh, I learned a lot of surprising aspects of how communities and, and, and communities of relig religious communities and traditions tend to fail uh, in terms of like how we help common life. Uh, it feels to me sometimes our traditions create more of a sectarian, dualistic mindset that it may be hidden in the marketplace, but it's present in terms of how prejudice and other exclusions hide. My personal journey into this specific conversation, and I want to say we're engaged in race, we're engaged in gender, we're engaged in social justice issues that intersect around socioeconomic poverty. I mean, we talk about divisions, socioeconomics are powerful dividers in our society. But to the conversation about my LGBTQ friends and, and, and close mentors and people who I love, uh, I was introduced to a whole new narrative of exclusion at the hands of religion and Christian religion and sought to do a very thoughtful and multi-year process of working on the theology and the philosophy. And we have this term in the church world called ecclesiology or how we do church and our policies. And the group, and you saw it in the video, the group I was a part of actually gave permission to disagree and actually stay together. And that was another through line from our congregation. So we were surprised. 
when we started getting not so fan mail from leaders in the denomination. We were surprised, and I was surprised personally, when we were asked to sort of leave the denomination peacefully. And because our church specifically was one of the handful that formed this group, it felt in principle wrong to just walk away. So that moment of sort of confronting what we felt was an ethical injustice, an ecclesial injustice, a theological injustice, and the laws were changing at the time, by the way. We thought that was an opportunity to insert a new narrative. Uh, I had hoped that it would be more of a positive outcome, and instead, it was a very painful outcome to be paraded in front of 500 of my peers, and then 1,000 delegates, and then have the entire congregation be thrown out of a group that said they prided themselves and actually disagreeing and staying together. I will say in that process, I learned again, and I, one of the key gifts to me as a white, cisgendered, straight, Protestant, Christian, male, living in America, is that I learned from my LGBTQ friends and dear mentors and colleagues in the marketplace a few things. One, that a lot of, a lot of stuff can be made up about you that just isn't true if you want to exclude. Like humans just love to create misinformation and spin misinformation because they just don't want to have the conversation. They don't want to include you. So they'll just create things. Very painful. Second, that uh, as, again, a white, straight, cisgender male, I can talk solidarity all night and day. I can talk mutuality. But actually feeling the sting of exclusion has taught me what is experienced most days in the lived reality of all who are marginalized. And that gave me a gift, a little bit of understanding as to how you remain in spaces that actually have wounded you. I'm still learning in that space. And then finally, I think the biggest insight for me was to have the courage to remain. Get a second job, but remain. <laughs> and what I mean by that is there was a moment where the time, the 100 people left our church. There was all conflict because people were historic. We're like, the bosses, the leaders are saying you're wrong and you shouldn't do this. And it was tense. And at that moment, I was volunteering in the business community. This was six years ago and leading a whole redevelopment effort on the east side of downtown Minneapolis. And the community said, well, we'd like to hire you to help lead this. And I said, Oh, they say we don't have any money for that, but if you go get the money, then we'll hire you. We actually worked together to do that. And that second job grounded me more deeply in the community and became a place for me to have a little more leverage. And so in this conversation about inclusion, as I learned from mentors, there comes a time where you have to put it all on the line for what you believe. And when you do that, sometimes you have to have backup plans. And in this case, the backup plan was the marketplace. And now I'm learning that you can actually set aside the Quran and the Bible and your holy text and prejudice is just as front and center as it was when you're back in your space. But I carry this concern because I'm still a pastor. The church is still there. It does good work about how we actually create a sense of common life together beyond our particular and unique beliefs and how we care for one another across our differences, both within the context of our religious tradition and then shared space outside of our tradition. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I think, you know, one of the things that we, we do wrestle with is how do you have the courage when, in fact, your job might be on the line and it might mean that you're not going to be able to, to you know, feed your family if you take this stand. Uh, but I think, you know, all of you on the stage here, that's, that's something that all of you have, have, have done. You've said we're principled and, um, yeah, it may get fired, um, but I'm going to stand uh, with that. And I think that's what that's where we are trying to go, you know, with this work. And sometimes it's really hard within an organization um, to take those courageous stands. So thank you for, for sharing that, uh, that with us. Um, and Mark, I've been following you for uh, a little while and I know that uh, you're certainly not afraid to speak uh, truth to power um, and obviously to accept those consequences. So what's wrong with this world? Why can't we get to this place where we, we look more from a both and perspective rather than that binary of it's, it's you know, it's either, either or? You know, I, I think there's always, and good afternoon everybody, I'm, <laughs> I'm excited to be here and, and intrigued by everyone's comments and, and looking forward to some dialogue about them. Um, I think we look for simple answers to complex questions. Simplicity is comfortable, it's easy. We love easy answers. Who doesn't want an easy answer, right? <laughs> the problem is the easy answer comes at a consequence as well. But easy answers produce consequences for the vulnerable. And we live in a world that does not tend to the vulnerable. 
with the same level of intensity and care mm -hmm. and commitment that we do to the powerful. Mm -hmm. And so the, the either or that we're talking about is how are we able to hold on to the best ideas that we can develop, the best solutions that we can develop while still keeping track of the consequences, both intended and unintended, expected and unanticipated of those choices. There are no problem-free solutions. If we look for a solution that won't produce any consequences or challenges or contradictions, we will do nothing but look and we won't solve anything. So as we talk and we think, even together today, we have to figure out how we can hold on to the best of these ideas but still say, yeah, but. So as I'm, even as I'm listening to this conversation, I'm thinking, okay, it's, and it's a great one. I, 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 as I heard you speak very brilliantly about this idea of history, we're all captive to history. We're all prisoners of history. We're all produced out of history. Our understanding of who and what we are is indebted to history. I, the identities we hold on to, the legacies we hold on to, the way we cook, the way we eat, the way we dress, the way we navigate the world, what our expectations are, how we worship, our political affiliations, all this stuff is linked in, in some form or fashion to history. And so, of course, if we're talking about social misery and, 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 and social um, inequality, we want to get to a point where we can get past the moment of tragedy. The great Howard Thurman in the theological tradition talked about not being prisoner of the event. Right. Right? That, that we don't have to be reducible to the moment that, which is our immediate experience either. That we don't have to be prisoner to the moment of the past, and we don't have to be prisoner to this moment. We can imagine something different and better. So I'd say, sure, let's get past it. The challenge, of course, is the either or thing. It can't be either or. It can't be let's wallow in the misery of the past or let's get past it. It's let's find a way to get past it but with a restorative process. I can't tell black people who are descendants of slaves to get over slavery if we haven't repaired the damage that has been done. Absolutely. I, I can't. It would, it would be bizarre for me to tell women who have made a fraction of what men have made doing the same job, often harder and better, that they should get past that if we don't find some type of intervention that will account for the gap in pay. Like, we have to deal with that stuff. So it's not, I, yeah, I would love to get over it. You know, but, like, we, I need something to get over it with. <laughs> we, we have to be able to tend to, I was thinking about your, your, your wonderful, Linda, your wonderful uh, sort of story about the university, which I find compelling. I mean, as a university professor, I would, I, I would be inclined to agree that there, I sometimes encounter students who are um, not quite prepared for the challenge that is in front of them. I haven't found that the recipients of affirmative action are particularly overrepresented in that category. Um, and if there are moments where they are, again, it's not either or, it's both and, right? Partly we have to account for the history and tradition, which is to say, the goal was never to get unqualified people in the room, it was to get qualified people in the room and to allow race to be a factor um, in admissions decisions, just like other factors are. Mm -hmm. As opposed to saying, which is what the dominant myth mythology is, let's take people who shouldn't belong there and bring them in into places they don't belong. But the question also becomes, how can we hold them accountable and how can we create a space of success? Because we want everybody to succeed. No point in admitting people to let them fail. Um, but how do we also hold the powerful accountable? I remember having this debate with my dear friend, Abby Huntsman, on, on, on TV years ago. And we had this exact conversation. She's a, and she's a really good friend. And we were talking, and, we, and she went to Penn for undergrad. I got my PhD from Penn. And it was this idea of how, what do we do with people who are in places that don't belong? <laughs> And I was thinking, wow, it's interesting, you know, because I took my classes in Huntsman Hall. The recipients of large donations get a hookup too. <laughs> Athletes get a hookup too, but nobody at Duke is mad or University of North Carolina is mad, you know what I'm saying, if Zion Williamson can't write the paragraph because they can get something out of his labor. So we have to find a way to think about, not just, not just to, to recognize affirmative action against the backdrop of poverty and race, but, against the, but also to understand against the backdrop of privilege and whiteness as another iteration of this race conversation. And, and the last thing I'd say really quickly is, is I think 
the both and means that when we talk about difference and inclusion and diversity, it can't just be about what it means not to be those things. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. we talk about diversity as like, how do, we, how do we diversify? That means how do we get brown people in here? How do we get black people in here? How do we include? The, the, the secret agent talk is how do we include poor people and black people and Muslims and Daisy folk? But, but we have to be able to put a spotlight on the dominant identities that you talked about as well. Because, you know, as, as Dan's talking about being white and male and cisgendered, et cetera, these are dominant identities that also have to be called into question. We have to talk about whiteness. Not just white privilege, but whiteness. Mm -hmm. right. right? And white supremacy. Right. Yeah. Because if we put our religious texts aside and our legal texts aside and we act like we treat everybody the same and neutral, we lose track of the fact that our conception of what the normal is, the flesh colored band-aid that don't look like my flesh, <laughs> right? The, 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 the news anchor that doesn't have an accent, but damn sure that's not like nobody in my hood, <laughs> right? That these neutral identities mm -hmm. are st still smuggle in notions of race, gender, class, sexual identity, et cetera. Right. And so we got to be willing to have a conversation about that right. and, and put a spotlight on whiteness instead of making that the norm that doesn't get talked about. Yeah, so, so let's talk about whiteness. A Pew study, um, 2019, said that... Let's talk about um, water, too. I'm, I ain't got no you, water. You, you ain't want water? You, you drank all your water? <laughs> we need some more water, folks. Um, so 75% of um, black people in the survey said that their race was very important to their identity. 56% uh, of Latinos said that their race was very important to their identity, and 55% of Asians said that their race was very important to their identity. How many, how, what percent do you think of white people said that their race was important to their identity? I'll tell you it was 15%. And so until white people recognize that whiteness is an identity that has to be in the equation, we can't have the conversation. Yeah. So I'll just... Could, could, could I? Yes, could absolutely. I, um, shoot back at that. I think we are now seeing the rise of a white identity movement, and it's not a good thing. Well, um, and I mean, this is, <laughs> look, I think what Donald Trump has been able to do is to create a new identity movement. I mean, this is one of the things that bothers me as a conservative, because I've always been about, let's, you know, what should your identity be? It should be American. We want you to be American. And that includes everybody. It doesn't mean being white, Anglo-Saxon, and Protestant. We are a country that is built on an idea, and anybody is welcome here to embrace that idea. But Donald Trump just turned that on his head. And he, he is very explicitly reaching out to people on the basis of their race. We have, I mean, all you have to do is look at the numbers. We have seen a big increase. I'm wondering if that uh, Pew poll, if it were done today and were done in a way that people didn't feel that maybe their answers would be held against them, uh, whether you wouldn't see a larger uh, number of people who identified and where whiteness was important to them. You know, I, I have a lot of things that are important to me, but I don't wake up every morning and say, being um, of Hispanic heritage is the first thing on my mind that I think of as who I am. I don't even wake up and think that being a woman, uh, except when I get to the mirror and start putting on the lipstick, then, you know, maybe then. But, you know, that, those are not the things that matter to me. What matters to me in terms of my own identity are the ideas I believe in, the things I've done, the work that I do. So I think we have to be careful here. I don't think that the solution is to create more awareness of whites that, you know, their, the color of their skin should be important to them. And by the way, according to demography, this problem is going to eventually almost disappear because there is so much mixing of people because people are intermarrying. Uh, my mother was, you know, Irish and English, blonde and, you know, blue-eyed. Uh, and my father was from a, a colonial family in New Mexico that had been there since 1601. Uh, my kids, I, one married a girl whose family is, you know, Scots-Irish. Another one married a girl who, uh, whose family came from Cuba and Ecuador. You look at my grandchildren and they look like the United Nations. I mean, it's, you know, it's a broad spectrum. And that is happening all over America. And so I think that you know, one of, the, uh, one of the things that we ought to embrace is that the color of your skin shouldn't be the most important thing to who you are. Now, I think that's your truth and, you know, and a valid one. 
But I think there's lots of people in the world. So I'm going to take this more global because I keep hearing the US. I'm not from the US, you know. Um, and it's my truth is actually I'm a Muslim, South Asian, British woman, and I'm very proud of that. Um, and that is my identity. But that doesn't mean that I don't, you know, that I ignore everything else. So. Yes, I'm very proud of what I've achieved. My, my dad was a taxi driver. I was the first person in my family to go to university. You know, poverty, yeah, we saw poverty. But actually, I came out of university with a pet, no, no debt. That's because my dad worked 18 hours a day. And that is my identity. And I'm proud of it, completely, 100%. And I will share it, I will shout about it. But also, my British heritage, is so important to me. The language I speak is so important to me. And I, you know, and I value that. So when I go around the world, when somebody says to me, where are you from? England. You know, and then it's, no, 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 where are you from? Um, Manchester, <laughs> you know? And actually what they want to know is, you've got a British accent, but you're brown. Well, ask me about it. Just ask me and I will tell you because actually my heritage is from Kashmir. And I, I will shout about that as well. So I feel very privileged to have a privilege. And I have my own. And I think that's the important thing. We talk about white privilege, but I think everybody in this room has a privilege. You just need to identify what that privilege is. Mm -hmm. you well, know? Oh, please. Let me have Dan. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I will just add sort of in my space on this conversation about white privilege, the lenses that I look through as a business association executive downtown relate to the fact that race is attached to, uh, to, to economy and to, to money in a very powerful and almost inseparable way. And even how our suburbs were formed in the Twin Cities and, and sundown laws that we are shameful to point away from in our second ring suburbs, like there's a deep history of privilege that actually plays into who's running what companies and where does the money lie. That's something that many of you may know. The thing that I find really curious to my religious journey, because that's what I really want to speak to today, is that I have come to learn, as I've come to understand the histories and the narratives and the wounds and the traumas, that it feels to me like uh, the European tradition of Protestant religion that came to the United States came overburdened with colonialism. Like the methods of colonialism are absolutely coalesced into the methods of a lot of facets of Protestantism, even more progressive Protestantism in some respects. And so I'm spending some time trying to unspool stories and theologies, yeah. curse of ham and sham, manifest destiny, mm -hmm. to ultimately realize that that white privilege that's attached to power is attached to a very historic construct of colonialism that I see tracing all the way to my congregation that I'm a part of and learning in in downtown Minneapolis. And it's troubling, and it's a lot of work, and it's not popular. By the way, our church is very healthy, but it's not like thousands come flocking to hear about colonialism and needing to reverse the curse <laughs> of ham and sham. Uh, uh, and yet it feels like that's the work for me. But it goes back to what Mark was saying, that, you know, if you don't unpack it, that's the easy way. Right. But you work to unpack it, right. that those are difficult conversations to have. And unless we have those difficult conversations, we're not going to move forward. And, and, and that's why I say we have to avoid, and this is like opposite day, because Linda and I are going to disagree a little bit on this point. And I never thought I'd say this. That's, Linda, why, that's why I'm but, in between. No, no, no. <laughs> this is good. I disagree on a lot. I yeah, know. Because I'm right. Gonna, but but this back. wouldn't be the one that people would expect. I'm saying you're being too hard on Donald Trump. <laughs> that's the opposite day part. Again, I think Donald Trump becomes a simple answer to a complicated question. Mm. Because we can say, look, Donald Trump is problematic in lots of ways in my estimation. <laughs> um, and... His policies absolutely play on xenophobia, they play on, on anti-blackness, they play on all sorts of things, we transphobia. I mean, we were going down the list of things that Donald Trump is problematic about. But I think when we make him the boogeyman, when we make him the reason why America is where and what it is, then we don't have to be accountable for a deep, consistent tradition of, of these very things. So, it, it, white, uh, and I agree that I don't, I don't want to rise in people who are proud to be white. That's not what I want. But I think the reason why we have, to, we have to take one step back, and I won't be long, but I just want to be clear. Whiteness is not the opposite of black. Whiteness and blackness are not opposite sides of the same coin. Yep. One has normative power, and the other does not. So my black pride is not the same as someone with white pride. My 
black nationalism, a desire to either create a, a kind of black nation state or the desire to have a kind of cultural attachment to blackness is not the same as white nationalism, which is built upon certain types of violence, certain types of beliefs of the inferiority of others. They're not opposite sides of the same coin. And so part of why white people are able to navigate the world at 15% uh, without having to think, based on the pupil, of not thinking about whiteness and not thinking about their race is because their race is regarded as normal, right? So if I say I want a doll, I don't say I need a white doll, I say I want a doll. I gotta, I gotta tell my daughter when she was younger, like, I can get you, I can get you a black doll, mm -hmm. right? So there's a way that whiteness is normative. It's taken for granted. And so, yes, the white people who are invested in whiteness in that way are invested in an unequal dominant power relationship. I don't want more of that. I'm with you on that. I don't want more of that. I want a rise in white people who are aware of their whiteness, yeah. self-critical right. about that whiteness, and willing, and willing in some ways to destroy that whiteness. Not to destroy white people. Let me be clear, because, you know, I'd be on TV saying, you know, I mean, saying crazy. <laughs> Not to destroy white people, but to destroy this idea of whiteness. Part of, and, and that's where we have to make a distinction between race and ethnicity. The reason why black folk, part of why black folk in America, back to the history point, have to take pride in their blackness as opposed to a specific uh, ethnicity, because I don't know what tribe I'm from. I can't say, I mean, I can say I'm Mindy tribe or I'm from the Fulana tribe, but most people don't know because of the legacy of slavery. White, there are plenty of white folk who have pride in being Irish or pride of being Italian. That's not the issue. It's the whiteness thing that becomes the issue. But ethnicity, according to sociological studies, is not an impediment to social mobility. Those Irish folk you mentioned, those Polish folk we could think about, those Russian folk we talk about, after two or three generations, they no longer speak with it. Actually, after one generation, they no longer speak with an accent. <laughs> They're able to uh, just become an American, this capital A American. But that capital A American is secret agent talk for white. Because when we say that they, they, they're like, just like everybody else, it means that th 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 their Irishness doesn't stop them from getting a job. It did. I'm not saying it didn't. Right. I'm saying at this junction in history, it does not. But blackness still is a social impediment. It stops me from getting a job. I pay more for an interest rates. I get worse treatment at the hospital. They think I have a, a higher pain threshold than I do. I, I, I get suspended more. I get expelled more. I mean, I'm going down the list. And these things don't it get exhausted at the level of ethnic difference. And so at that level, we have to be accountable for the way that whiteness, but also, more importantly, white supremacy, white supremacy overdetermines. That is to say, it, 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 it shapes our experiences in ways that we can't reduce. And so I don't have the luxury in conclusion. <laughs> I don't have the luxury of just being American. Because this American experiment in self-governance didn't include me. When America was constructed, it wasn't constructed to include me. I was the labor. Our grandmothers and great-grandmothers were the labor that built this country. We were never expected to be. This white supremacy was a serpent wrapped around the table that the founding fathers used to construct these founding documents. We weren't in it. And, it, and so when we're celebrating the 4th of July, that's what Frederick Douglass was talking about. That wasn't us. When they said, when we fought for suffrage, they didn't mean us. The women's movement, liberation movement, didn't initially include us. None of these movements included black folk. So we don't have the luxury of just being American because right now, three, four, five generations later, even after building this thing, we are the first people who were told, if you don't like it, get out. You're not a real American. We, don't qu we question your identity. We question your loyalty to this nation. We're still getting that. And that is something that we have to really, really contend with. So I don't, it's not that I don't want people to love America. It's not that I'm saying don't be America. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying that we don't, that this melting pot. It doesn't. It doesn't include us in, in the ways we want it to, but also I don't want to be part of no melting pot. Some people can't melt. Some people can't melt. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. And melting pots elide difference. Right. The whole point of the melting pot is that the things that make you different are now blended in. And I'm saying, I want to live in a world where I see your difference. I don't want to live in a post-racial world. I want to live in a post-racist world. I want my different, I want you to see my, I want you to see my blackness. We see it. Oh, you can tell. <laughs> and I want you to like it. I just don't want it to be a social demerit. Right. Just like I don't want being a woman to be a social demerit. I don't want being a Jew to be a social demerit. I don't want being a Muslim to be a social demerit. I want to see those differences and celebrate those differences. That's why we use the salad bowl metaphor rather than the melting exactly. pot me metaphor. Because I want all them ingredients. I want the paprika and the lauris. And you want to taste it and yes. see it. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. I, and I just like to yeah, say, can you see my brownness as well? Because I'm not black and I'm not white. So I kind of sit in the middle somewhere. That's super important. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I do think, Mark, that you did bring up an, uh, an important point. And you've got a degree in anthropology, yeah. and it showed in some of what you said.
because the, uh, the lives of African Americans are different than the lives of all the other groups that have contributed to this country, with the exception of maybe the one analogous are Native Americans, um, who were after all here first. I, uh, can I just pipe but, in there? I, I don't think it's a maybe, I think it's a definite. Yeah. You know, I mean, with the Native no, Americans. It absolutely is different. Because as you talked about whiteness, and you, you talked about Irish, Italians, etc., when those groups came here, they were not considered white. Right. And yes. you're right about the normative aspects. I think, I think you are correct about that. So I'm not, you're not totally, I'm not totally disagreeing with you. What I'm suggesting, and I, I don't like the salad metaphor or the melting pot metaphor. I like the mosaic metaphor. Hmm. Because in a mosaic, we do retain something that is individual, is particularized, uh, and has its own beauty. But the beauty of the whole is enhanced when you step back and you see what each has contributed. So that's, that's the metaphor that, that I, I like. like that. To, yeah. like Can I use that? <laughs> <laughs> right, there's no problems in Canada. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> so uh, thank you all um, uh, so much. Um, this has been a f fascinating, uh, fascinating, fascinating discussion. And uh, you can see that while we have some differences, uh, we have some similarities. Just, just one more thing. We're going to ask you all to uh, engage in some dialogue in just a couple of seconds. But I um, just wanted to say something, you know, um, regarding um, whiteness. And, you know, who's defining what white is right now? And that's, I think that's the point that you were making. I want to kind of get back to that point mm, because point. who's defining it right now, right? Are the white nationalists right? Are the are the hate group? That's who's defining whiteness. And I think what what I think what you're suggesting is that we need to we need to acknowledge whiteness from a different perspective. From a and it, it, it is being defined by others. And Nassim, I'm gonna I'm gonna take some liberties here and talk about the conversation we, we had, had backstage. Yeah. So Nassim was concerned that the the layout here had, as she put it, the people of color on one side and whites on the other. And I said, wait a second, my name is Chavez. I'm an Hispanic. I'm not usually considered white. But some of it is in the eyes of the beholder. And it goes back to the point that uh, Mark was, ma was making. Now, maybe my white hair now makes me a little paler, and so maybe I fit into that category. Mm -hmm. But depending on where you're coming from, when I go to Europe, people always think of me as white and European-American and they don't ever think of me as, quote, a minority. But here in the United States, I am not considered white. And I'm an ex-European, right. considering we've just had Brexit. Right. So, so, I mean, some of it is, you know, <laughs> it's social, it is social construct. It is race, um, you know, is something that is defined in a way that, for example, if ethnicity, I think, has some basis in reality. What ethnic group, but as you said, Mark, because of the way African Americans came here. They did not come here voluntarily. They didn't migrate or immigrate to the United States. They were forcibly brought here. They were uh, enslaved, and they were not allowed to keep any aspect of their language, their culture, any part of it. And so that has uh, had a very, very defining characteristic. But there are now, because of DNA tests and, and other things, there are now efforts, I was profiled on Finding Your Roots um, uh, with Skip Gates. And a lot of the people on his show uh, are, in fact, tracing their roots back. And I discovered, for example, that although my family came here in 1601, the reason they came here is apparently they were converso Jews and were hiding that fact in Spain for 100 years yeah. and came here with the Inquisition uh, on their tail. They were, they were being investigated by the Inquisition. So all of us have these stories, more of us because of things like DNA tests can now find out about these stories. And I do think they're important to individuals in, in the way that you talk about it, but I don't think that socially we are helped when all of us want to hold on to our difference. I do think that the importance is trying to find out what it is we have in common what it is we share. But, but let me ask you that, just one quick question. But what differences do we get to hold on? For example, I would never tell my Jewish friends that they shouldn't hold on to that Jewishness, Yeah. right? 
I would say that that's a key, even the story you just told me about, I'm assuming Sephardic Jews who are coming over here and forced to hide their identity, that's an, that's an awful atrocity. And the idea that they may have to blend into American whiteness in order to be safe to me is awful. They should be able to hold on to their Jewishness. And I would hope and I think, think largely we don't ask people not to hold on to that. Um, I don't think that we ask people not to hold on to their Christianness. Um, I think, though, when it comes to the question of race in particular, and, 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 and particularly in the American black-white racial context, um, I think we're much more quick to tell people not to hold on to this race thing when that is the foundational and formative logic and calculus of America. I think it's incredibly difficult to let that go because in some ways that is as central to my identity well, as those other things. I, ha I happen to think that American culture is in fact in large part what it is because of the contribution of enslaved people who were brought here. Our yeah. music, I mean, you know, you, you can't, with, without Africans, we don't have much of a culture, frankly. Or a country, or, right? So, you know, so I, I'm not suggesting that people give that up, nor do I suggest, I mean, I still, you know, make frijoles and enchiladas at home. I mean, that's, and I'm always going to do that. Um, my grandkids uh, don't, on the other hand, always, you know, uh, eat that way. So, I mean, we're, you can hold but, on. But, but, but that's my point. There, there's a, there, and I, I hope that your great-grandchildren eat enchiladas and, and, and understand the deep and rich tradition from which you come. But the, even the idea that they can make that choice is a very different experience. Existentially, my, my, my child, my daughter doesn't have a choice about whether or not she, I mean, she could, she, she could eat what she wants. She gonna walk down the street, she's still gonna be black. And her yep, great grandchildren yep. are still gonna be black. So there's a way that our, this race thing for us it is different. It's different, it and so, different. It, and, but that's my point about black and white not being opposite sides of the yeah. same coin, right. is that in many ways I don't have that luxury. And I don't think people, sh and I don't think that it's a, a purely a benefit to be able to hide stuff, because right. I don't want to live in a world where you should have to. Mm -hmm. But, now, yeah, please. Can I take it back to that conversation we did have? Mm. Um, but you were very quick to own your identity when we had that conversation. Um, you know, for the, right. for the reason that we've had it. So even though the Americanness and again, I like to stress, I'm from the UK. Um, <laughs> we, we would not have known. By yeah, <laughs> but I want to make sure you do. <laughs> you, you still held on to the fact that, it, you know, you're Hispanic. And that's a very important point for me. So Mary Frances and I had this conversation because we're both DNI consultants. So we're conditioned to think like that. Mm -hmm. And we both questioned it. So we, you know, because it's just something that we do. You know, I can see... Many of my DNI friends there, and I'm sure they'd be the same, regardless of what colour they're there. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think that it's, that's just the way we are conditioned to do that. And if I bring this back to the fact that this is a DNI conference, actually, a lot of the things that we're doing is is making our future fluent. So both you and I don't have that option. Mm -hmm. My kids are going to walk down the street, and they're always going to be brown. You know, we're never ever going to get rid of that. But actually, when we start to work together that's when we, we reduce those. And those are difficult conversations to have. And I think we had a conversation earlier. I'm a Muslim woman, and I get asked all the time, how are you ever gonna help me? I, I'm gay or I'm, a, you know, I'm lesbian, or how are you ever gonna help me? How are you ever gonna do that? And actually, when I walk into an organization, I walk in there for the equality of everyone. I don't care who you are. I want to make this world a better place. And it's not living in Gaga land. It's actually doing something hmm. to make this place a better place. Because actually, when my kids walk, then their kids walk down the street, or your grandkids walk down the street, I want them to head up high and be proud of what the heritage that they've had, but also be able to walk down and say, actually, I'm British, or I'm American, or you know, whatever identity they choose to have. Because it's the choice that they make. It's not something that should be determined by other people. So we're going to have some, some, some table Sorry. talk. Sorry. That's all right. But, <laughs> but, uh, but Dan, I, want, I really want you to have the, the last word because I'm not sure that your voice has, has um, been amplified as, as much as I would, would like it to well, be. Well, I'm modeling my philosophy of entering into spaces to listen, to learn, to be mentored, and to participate, and when asked, mm -hmm. to speak. Okay. So I feel like the contribution I can add I'm working on it, right? Uh, is that the invisible differences are, are different 
and I don't think we can quantify powerfully different, but as much real. So what do I mean by that? The intersectionalities mm -hmm. of sexual orientation. And yes, there are ways that we present at work and in public that can sort of give clues as to who we are, but the minute that you come out, the conversation changes radically. Mm. And in our religious environments, the minute you come out, it may mean incredibly painful exclusion. Mm -hmm. It may be a surprise to you, but I am full-blooded Jewish. My mother's side of the family, their maiden name is Goldstein. They came from Russia. They were kind of labor as they came as immigrants to the United States. They became conservative Jews. My mother converted to Christianity. It was not a very smooth process, but our family was a Christian family. And then as I became a Christian vocational minister, I spent at least one Saturday a month going to my Goldstein family's Jewish synagogue. Mm. And now as I understand and, and sort of uh, I'm, I'm horrified at the violence against Jewish people, largely because of the white supremacist movement, right. uh, I, I have these multiple identities that appear into spaces where my Jewish friends and my rabbis, I have many uh, rabbi friends, male and female, reformed and conservative, and I am, again, learning and listening and finding ways to be a better ally. So I will just comment that the visible aspects of our differences that you cannot change are, to me, they're the most powerful. But right next to that, and then of course intersecting those invisible identity issues uh, are also the root at why we exclude one another and why I believe not only religion needs to do better, but as we hide our religion to come into the marketplace, we need to know each other and understand each other relationally to have any hope to be able to bridge these intersecting identities of religion, race, and uh, age, and skin. And, and so that, that's just how I feel about that piece of it. And I am deeply learning from you as well, even as we sit on this panel. Okay, I, thank you. Sorry, I, I oh. just need to say this. <laughs> I don't know any religion in the world that says you have to discriminate about with anyone. If you're not a good human being, teach me how to be a good Muslim or a Christian or a Jew or a Hindu or a Sikh. First, it's being a good human, and then it's the religion bit. Mm -hmm. And if you can't do that, I don't know which religion you can be part of. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm going to give you all five minutes to sort of turn within pods of five, six, or how many ever. And I had a question that I had developed, but I'm going to give you all a different question. And the question is, that I want you to, to, to talk about, um, I think they we're going to put the question on a slide, but I have a new question now. I think it's a, oh. Is, oh, I'm not going to ask you that question. Take that question down. <laughs> <laughs> because, the, because the question that I want to ask is, what are one or two or three things that you've gleaned from this conversation that you, that, that you want to hear more about, because we're gonna have another session tomorrow. Um, I, I've, unfortunately, not with the, the panelists here, but I'm gonna facilitate another conversation about what we've talked about you know, today, at, and they're gonna tell you in a few minutes what, what time that session is. Um, but I wanna know, I want you all to talk about what have you gleaned, one, two, or three things that you've gleaned from this conversation that we've had, and what can you do with it? What can you go back and do with what you've gleaned, okay? So turn and, and do something. Five minutes, right? Get, get with some other folk. Okay. Let's come back together. Let's come back together. I knew if I did this that um, you all wouldn't want to come back together because you're having such great conversation. All right, all right. So, do um, you think we had some real talk today? Yeah. All right, let's give the panelists a hand. Right. Do, do you have some things that you can, that you can take and, and use? You know, I, I talk about um, the fact that talking is great, but we gotta take the talk to what? Action, absolutely, we gotta take the talk to action. So I'm hoping that you can, um, Take something um, that you've learned here. I know that I've got two or three things that I can, you know, immediately, uh, immediately do. Um, but um, Reverend Dr. Dan, I would like to thank you so much um, for your participation and your insights. Linda, absolutely, thank you for being here and uh, thank you for um, sharing with us. Dr. Mark, 
Glad that you could be a part of this it's panel as well. An and Nassim, thank you for continuing to, to bring us to the global conversation. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate that. So I want to thank um, all, of our, um, all of our panelists, and um, I want to thank you as well. I think we have, um, is, do we have Q&A now? Oh, oh, I have questions. Wait a minute. I have questions on, on my iPad. OK, nice. that's what they told me. All right, so Man. here we go. Yeah, here we go. It's loading now. So what questions do you have for the panel? What's the most important first step we can take to invite more fruitful conversations in our own places of work? I, for me, it, it, and I'll be really quick, I think it's holding space for, um, for tension. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to be willing to, to if you're going to have courageous conversations, you have to also have humility. You have to have forgiveness. It doesn't mean that you let people say and talk outside of their neck, you know, about everything. But what it does mean is that there has to be room for people to make mistakes. There has to be room for people to say things imperfectly. There has to be room for people to not understand something and to not assume the worst in each other. Uh, when people make mistakes, Amen. but to create room for people to, 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 to trip and to fall and to get up and to operate in good faith. And on the other side of that, you have to be willing to be held accountable. Yep. The result of being held accountable can't be tears. Right. It can't be, well, I'm on your side. Why are you yelling at me? It, it, there has to be that balance and that back and forth of real humility, real engagement, real contrition, um, and, and just seeing the best in each other. Yeah, because when people make mistakes, I like it to riding a bike. When you learn how to ride a bike, what you gonna do? You gonna fall off, right? Until you Every time. Uh, un, until you learn how to ride that bike. What we do now with people who make a mistake, we we cancel. Right. right? You're a bike. You're you're a failed bike rider. Get out of here. You know, <laughs> done. You never ride a bike again. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I do want to jump in and promote Mary's book. That it's called. We can't talk about that at work. I read it recently when you jumped into the panel to moderate it. I wanted to understand your work. And I just have to say, besides being like chock full of like modeling and examples, the one big takeaway that I thought was helpful was that you can't do it. It's not a one and done. That you need to accept non-closure. You need to accept it as a dynamic set of relationships and conversations tied to the power structures and the decision making. And if you're committed to the long haul, that you commit to actually pausing and taking a step back and then getting back at it another day. I just wanted to thank you for that contribution yeah. and that the book is a really important, valuable oh. add to that question. Thank you. I, I I wrote the check for you. <laughs> <laughs> Not pay me. I, I'd like to say you need to do the work. Right. Yeah, yeah. You need to be able to do that foundational work. So if you want to explore those conversations, then be prepared to be able to take it to the next level. Right. Yeah. So another question that we have is in what ways can deconstructing whiteness help advance our conversations about ethnicity, race, and identity? Who wants to take on that one? I didn't hear it. In what ways can deconstructing whiteness Adva help to advance our conversations about ethnicity, race, and identity? Well, I'll, I'll, since I threw out this, uh, this notion of uh, white identity as being problematic, um, you know, I've always uh, thought that ethnic identity uh, was a more fruitful conversation than simply racial identity. But I think Mark makes a, a very important point that for many African Americans, there are many ethnicities in Africa it isn't, you know, there isn't one big group called Africans. There are many, many different separate ethnicities that differ as much from each other as Swedes do from Italians. Um, and so I think trying to get more information, trying to get people to focus in that way uh, often is more helpful. But I, I want to say something about what we just talked about, because I liked what Mark had to say, but I want to take it a step further. I think it is important to acknowledge our past but I think if we're going to have fruitful conversations and difficult conversations, we have to make sure that we do not hold those who are living in the present for the sins of the fathers. We have to start with a clean slate. We have to assume people have good intentions. And we don't simply want to name call and blame people for what was done in the past, because that's going to get us nowhere. Can we hold people accountable without Blaming? Yeah, like, like it's, it's, it's not a random white person who I'm having this conversation with about slavery. It's not their fault that my ancestors were enslaved. They didn't enslave me. And I, I think it isn't a fruitful conversation to, to tell them that they are, it's their fault. But I think there's a difference between blame and responsibility. Yeah. 
And I think there's a way to talk about the fact that currently there are, there are, comp there are corporations, there are families, there are individuals, there are social, cultural, intellectual traditions that are indebted to the, to the legacy of slavery. And so there are ways that white people still benefit from that slavery. And so I don't hold a white person to blame from, for in slavery, but I do want them to recognize that if you start off on second base and I'm just getting to the bat, you know, I'm just get, picking up my bat, that, that, that advantage isn't because you're a better baseball player. And then we can figure out how we can end up in the same place. But we have to be willing to be honest about that part too. And then, yeah, I agree, we, we, can, we can get somewhere. Yeah. So there was a comment um, that um, uh, that the white man <laughs> they called you the white man the white man <laughs> on the panel. Oh wow! <laughs> on the all, this, all my life I've been talking about the white man. I met him. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I am a white man. It says the, the white man. The, the, the white man was was quiet um, and said he was listening. Uh, we don't need you to listen. We need you to speak up. Thank you for inviting me to speak up. <laughs> to this last question, uh, I feel like it. The blame game doesn't work because it oftentimes, not all times, but oftentimes does close people down and then you don't have an opportunity to actually have the hard conversations. And I'm just gonna say it because largely white people for the very percentage that you raised, we can just assimilate back into our power and privilege in the flow of homogenous neighborhoods and sectors of our society and not deal with the fact that we are connected. I believe we are connected and have to be aware and have to learn to talk about. I'll give you a very specific example. My work in the business association work is about helping incubating and celebrate and accelerate small and diverse businesses in the downtown core. As I've done outreach to friends and neighborhoods and small business associations, the conversations about how economics are attached to power and race are right here. And if I don't have a clear understanding about how whiteness in that construct is attached to the trauma and exclusions to our black and brown communities, then I'm, I'm, I'm completely out of pocket. And then I'll get defended when something sparks, when there's anger about those exclusions. And so while that shame, like shouting people down when you just met them can close things down, I'm at least as a white man seeking to be aware of that trauma and recognize that any time it'll spark, and I need to hold that space and not necessarily take it personally, but be able to actually lean into the conversation and then develop a relationship through that shared sense of empathy and, and, and understanding about what's real as opposed to just the white safety and assimilation. But I think there's also the question, because uh, I think you're right. I, I think, though, the idea of, of, of engaging in a way to stop people from shut, shutting people down can also become a way of prioritizing white feelings, white fragility, white tears, white, you know, and, and, and so, because it, it's, it's still in white people's interests, just like it's in men's interests to, to sustain sexism and patriarchy, right? right? And if I say, well, if you talk to me, if they explain to me the right way, I won't shut down. If you, if you talk about sexism the wrong way, I'm just gonna shut down and not have the conversation. Yeah, that's true, I can shut down and not have the conversation, and I might really be upset, but I also am holding on to my, I'm running out the room with my power. Right? And so there has to be a way that we don't make the entire uh, project of race talk or gender talk or sexual, sexuality talk, gender identity talk, um, or religion talk hinge upon the feelings and, and of, of the powerful. Sure. And, and, and trying to find that balance again of trying to engage people humanely and with love, yeah. but also not saying, well, I gotta, I gotta walk on eggshells to make sure that I don't mm -hmm. upset yep. men. Because somehow white, People, and white men in particular, um, and white Christian men in particular, have managed to find an entire country and colonize it. I know. And dominate it and build it. It's I mean, y'all some brilliant people. So <laughs> it's very... I'd like to think that y'all can have a conversation without shutting down if y'all really want to, right? Yeah. So I want to be able to strike that balance, recognize your humanity, but also understand the power and balance. For but sure. If you want I me agree. to clean the slate, come and help me do it. Yeah. There are no clean slates. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I think I would love to start with a clean slate, but, but we're, okay. I, I, I'll end where I started. We're products of history. Mm -hmm. There are no clean slates. Right. And I would never ask people who have, I would never ask someone in Cambodia to have a clean slate mm -hmm. after the awful atrocities of Pol Pot. I would never ask an African person to have a clean slate in South African after, after apartheid. But I want them to, I, you, just, I mean, let me have you, I'll give you the last word. I, I want to hear what you have to say. Okay. I just want to finish this thought. The, I, I want to engage from where we are and bring the best out of each other, but 
I don't think we can be healthy or functional or safe or loving if we don't, if we don't acknowledge that, that slate is dirty. We can write on top of it and we can make a beautiful thing on top, maybe a mosaic. But I think we, got, but, but I think we have to hold, keep track of that other thing. That, that's all I'm saying. Please. Well, I, I would just say that, that you're right. You can't just wipe the slate clean. But if you want to look at a country that did it well in trying to, to come together, it was South Africa in its reconciliation. Because you cannot continue to hold a grievance for history. I mean, that is not a recipe for coming together. That mm. is a recipe for, you know, the Balkans War and for retribution uh, when a new group takes power. I think you're right, you have to acknowledge history, but history cannot define the way forward if it is going to be about my inflicting on you the pain that my ancestors had to bear. That's not a way but forward. What the South Africans did do, though, is they made the, the, um, the, those uh, to, to a, a acknowledge and account for the, the, what, the, for the wrongs. So yes. it, wasn't, it wasn't just, you know, no, it wasn't it, just, we're, wipe, the, we're not wiping the, the slate clean. We're saying that you have to say that you were wrong. And I think we do need to do that. But We haven't done that point, in the United States. Well, I, I, I think we're, we're doing it more all the time. Yeah, but like, America has never, like, I mean, even in, I mean, you could think about Durban in 01 or 2000. Like, I mean, uh, South Africa is an interesting model because I would argue that even in the truth and reconciliation, the Afrikaners still have all the power, exactly. right? They still own all the land. There's still a, a power imbalance that is partly because we haven't kept track of the fundamental ways that apartheid has functioned. But even if I were to stipulate that, even if I took that off the table for a minute, there's been an acknowledgement that an atrocity was committed as, as a national position. Right. This country has never apologized for slavery. This right. country has never we acknowledged We fought a civil war over slavery. No, we fought a civil war. Yeah. That, that, that's just a okay. historical, I mean, I, that's a different uh, conversation. But well, no. They we, will we, never we, ask me to we're moderate, never, right. moderate <laughs> again <laughs> because I've been getting all sorts of messages oh, right. that the time is up. Please stop. <laughs> Please end the conversation. So I, again, want to thank the panelists, and I, and I want to go back to what Mark said at the very beginning, that this is a, that these topics, these, these conversations are complex they're not simple. And I think we saw that this afternoon. But hopefully, uh, well, I think that the conversation was amazing. And I'm glad that we were able to have a conversation where we have showed that there are differences. So let's give the panelists another hand. And we are supposed to now leave. Are we supposed to leave the stage? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah we're yeah, supposed yeah. to leave the stage. Oh, we've been supposed oh, to well, that yeah. left. <laughs> I mean, I mean, <laughs> Thank you all very much. Polite, about it. Polite, yeah. Like flashing the lights. Yeah. <laughs> Relax. Before I let go, I already came on. <laughs> Let's give Thank our speakers you. another big round of applause. Yes. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. That was some real talk. Yes, yeah, some for real, real talk. Yeah, I just want to say thanks again to Mary Frances, to Dan, Mark, Linda, and Nassim, and give a big shout out to all the presenters. Uh, bring bold and authentic approaches to real talk and walking the talk in their workshops this year. It is really important that we keep encouraging and challenging one another's viewpoints and perspectives. So if you would like to continue the conversation, please join Mary Frances tomorrow at room 11, I mean, L-100G at 1115 a.m. for a deeper dive on the topics discussed just this past afternoon. Yes, it has been a very big day. Yes. Yeah, yeah right. And tomorrow is another big day, too. Yes. Now, remember the judging of the invention sprint happens in session S4A tomorrow at 8 a.m. And we have another dynamic general session planned for lunch, which, by the way, will be in this space tomorrow. Let me say that again. Lunch will be served in this general session space tomorrow at 12.45 p.m. And there will be tables. Yes. Don't worry, you guys. You don't have to eat like, like this, <laughs> you know, all awkwardly. And then breakfast again will be out in the marketplace just like this morning. And for those of you guys who want to start their day early with some self-care, get some exercise going, at the YMCA George Wellbeing Center, they are offering chair yoga at 7.15 tomorrow morning. Uh, followed by a singing bowl meditation at 8.15. Yes, and while we're on the topic of food, please note that Seven, a nearby steakhouse and sushi bar, is offering a free drink and 10% off a dinner entree with your forum name badge. It's a great deal. Totally worth it. Yes. Surf and turf. You deserve it. And one other note, session S6. 
dash K, the future of work, what DEI looks like for tech, the gig economy, and the new cultural worker has been changed. And it will be now from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. tomorrow in room M100 FNG. You can find other room change information on the signage directly out on the marketplace. All right, so right now we hope that you all will join us uh, to debrief a bit, unwind and enjoy some food, drinks, yes, and conversation during the networking reception in the marketplace. Yes, drinks. I'm <laughs> very excited about that. Yeah, can we get some applause for drinks? Okay, make sure you grab a ticket from a volunteer on your way out into the reception for your chance to win a prize giveaway. All right, thanks again to our guest speakers, Dan, Linda, Mark, and Nassim for bringing it today. And a big thank you to Mary Frances Winters for stepping in to moderate this afternoon's session, and especially big thanks to KPMG for sponsoring this session. All right, see you guys at the reception. Mm -hmm.